Amen. I'm an evangelist. I want to be a race car driver. <laughs> if you don't believe me, ask some of them troopers in them other states. Uh, you know, I will mention this. Uh, I don't talk about it, but uh, it, 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 it seems to be a subject that is pretty constant. I'll just tell you a little bit about the health. Um, I'm dying. It's going to happen. Uh, I eat everything that's bad for me, and I guarantee I'll never make it to 102. Um, I heard they, they interviewed a guy who's 105 years old. They said, how do you live to be 105? Yeah, somebody like they had something to do with it. And the guy goes, well. And then he forgot what he was going to say. Anyway, you know, he said, uh, <laughs> after you're 100, you got to be real careful. And that is my man. I am, I, he, that is my advice, brother. After, when I turn 100, I am slowing right down. Because I'm shooting for 105. And, um, but I tell you, we, as far as health, a uh, couple of things, you know, the, 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 I told you about Kathy's eye with the new contact lens. Um, she sees better. And it's funny because she got the new contact lens. And she said, you are really old. But um, I said, yeah, you're seeing better. I can see that right now. Um, and so pray for her because that, that eye is a continual problem. It is, if you, you've heard of shingles, have that inside your eye. That is just not a pleasant thing. It's like a wildfire. So she deals with that. Uh, I deal with a couple things. You know, the neck is the big deal. Um, I, I, I'll give you this. A few months ago, we went to a neurosurgeon. And uh, some of the problems, I, I won't go into details about the problems, but he basically said there's permanent damage to my spinal cord and the problems that we had him look at, he said they're never going to be taken care of, even with surgery. Um, and th that was the good news. I told her, I said, I'm going to going to doctors. They never tell me anything good. So what do I do? I go to a stinking doctor and I turn into a prophet. Never told me anything good. And he said, I said, well, what's the bad news? He said, well, the bad news is that the 08 fusion has come loose. So what you suspected is true. I have a screw loose. <laughs> but the, the, the problem is, he's, I said, what do you want to do? You know, right now it's fused from C4 to 7. And he said, well, we go in and take it all out and go up a level to C3 and then fuse it solid. And I said, Doc, I'm not doing that. They've cut on me three times. Cut on me here, cut on me here, come, cut on me here. I got one more spot here. We're holding out for more money. I figure this is some high dollar real estate right back here. And, and I'm sorry, guys, look, you can tell me all you want uh, about good sense and everything else. I said, I have been cut on three. I'll get it done. I'll get it done. If the Lord tarries, I'll get it done because I'll have to get it done. But I said, um, I said, I just, I cannot take myself to a hospital and say, lay down and say, cut on me. I'm sorry, I just can't do it, guys. And he said, well, I understand that. But he said, if, if you're in a car wreck and you catch an airbag, it'll change your life. So if you will pray that I don't kiss an airbag. But why would I kiss Hillary Clinton anyway, right? <laughs> I'd rather kiss a goat, okay? I wouldn't catch near the stuff from a goat. If I made the goat mad, it wouldn't kill me in the night. But, um, but anyway, so just, uh, just be in prayer about that. Uh, it, is, uh, you know, it is what it is. Now, guys, I, I hate to say this, though. I know everybody says you're in bad health. I, I'm real happy, real happy. I... Uh, I walk, I, t I, can, I can, I was telling somebody today, I said I, I was on a plane, it was not a particularly good day. Kathy wasn't with me and things were not real good. And I said, Lord, I, 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 fed, I dressed myself this morning and I fed myself this morning. I carried my own luggage. What am I supposed to complain about? And I want to testify to this church, I have no complaint against my God. Okay? I have no complaint. He, is, he, he didn't do anything wrong. Uh, he didn't have to explain anything to me. Um, and... You say, well, but isn't it bad? Not bad as hell. I got off light, guy. So, so I, am, I am as happy as if I had good sense. So that's, uh, uh, that is that. Uh, I'll tell you a couple things about the book table. Uh, this is a little booklet on repentance. <clears throat> there are people that say repentance is turning from sin. And, and guys, watch what you say because there's a Bible to compare it to. And the Bible says, in various places, God repented. Would anybody like to say God repented, turned from sin? He never even turned from the sinner, okay? But God repented. He changed his direction. He turned around, changed his mind. And so this is probably the best little study that I have seen on repentance. It really is. The scripture, there it is. 
Uh, and so that, uh, that is back there. This one, the corruptions of the New King James Version. I call it version. I don't like to call it the Bible. Some of you think that the New King James is, even you, you think the New King James is the King James without the these and thous. It's the King James without the Word of God. That's what it is. And, and I'll just give you a little freebie, okay? I don't even know if it's in this book. But um, uh, open your Bible to, to um, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6. Zechariah 13. Have you ever had anybody smug? And they go, oh, which King James do you use? Do you use the 1611 or do you use the 13, the 1638 or the 1769? And I'm thinking, how many stitches would you like? Amen. Look what it says in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6. And, um, and one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? Is that not a prophetic reference to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? And I've got, I, when I, I have two briefcases full of modern translations that when I drive, I take them with me to show what's wrong with them. But I have to have two King James, New King James. I have to have two New King James. I can't have one. You know why? Because the New, the King, James, the New King James came out in 1982. And if you have a 1982 New King James version, here's what it says. Uh, and one, one shall say to him, what are these wounds in your hands? So they changed thine to yours. I'm not for changing anything, but what I'm saying is the prophecy is still there, correct? What are these wounds in your hands? They're still there. That's in 1982. What they didn't tell you is that in 1994, they went through the New King James and made changes and never told you. If you have a new New King James, it says in verse 6, what are these wounds between thine arms? Between your arms. And you just lost the prophetic reference to the, to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So if you're using New King James, which one are you using, the 1982 or the 1994? My 1994, you guys know this. King James Bible in 1611 came out with the, with the Apocrypha between the Testaments. They, did, they, they gave uh, the understandable history back there has the seven reasons why the King James translators did not accept the Apocrypha as, as Scripture, but it was a history between the Testaments at 400 silent years. And, um, and there are people trying to say, well, we should put it back in because it was there before. They're doing that because they want to get, get along with the Catholic Church. But my 1994 New King James has the Apocrypha in it. Now, now the, the New King James never had the Apocrypha originally. Why would they start putting it in now unless somebody is trying to yoke up with Rome? So the New King James is not the King James Bible, without the these and thous. It's not easier to read. So that's just a little spread to love. Um, this one is Catholic Myths Exposed. Sometimes you have to deal with Roman Catholics. You should learn about them. That is there. Kathy will be back there, and, uh, and she will take care of you, uh, and then, and then uh, we'll be gone. Um, we are leaving right after church because after I get done preaching this, I want to get out of town as fast as I can. But um, actually, some of you are getting the night off. You really are. Uh, you know, guys, you know, we go, you guys, you know, you don't pay attention to what we say because you're so hard-hearted and you're so mean and you're so wicked. Now, you know why sometimes you don't, you don't pay any attention to a preacher? Because nothing he's going to say applies. I'll give you an example. I was preaching at a multi-preacher meeting, you know, conference, Bible conference, some years ago. And, uh, and, and at one service, I think it was during the mornings, they had three speakers. I wasn't one of them. <clears throat> and I was there. And the first guy got up and talked about how to secure a building. You know, a lot of churches. I think this church started in some, probably some rented building and then, you know, got a building. The building over was in Glendale. I remember that building we preached in. And now over here, built one. And if you're a pastor... Anybody that's going to get up it was, and, and speak about how to secure a building, that guy's going to help you, right? Well, we haven't had a house for 32 years. What do you, I don't need to know how to secure a building. So I didn't need that one. And then the second guy got up and talked about uh, how to get a second man. <laughs> I, I'm not even looking for him a first, actually. Okay? I'm not trans nothing. 
I had this guy call me one time, this pastor, we're going to have a meeting. He said, no, I'm bivocational. So I'm preaching for you. I didn't preach by nothing. <laughs> but, um, and so this guy's talking about how to, how to get an assistant. Guys, guys, I don't need an assistant pastor. So that one didn't apply. And the third guy got up and talked about how to raise your children. Well, our kids were all grown. They're all grown now and in prison. <laughs> Enters the famous question. It's 11 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? Cell block D. I said that one time, some, I almost said stupid woman, I won't say that. Some Democratic woman came up and said, are your boys really in prison? I said, no, they're not in prison, they're not in prison, they're not in prison. They're not, they ought to be in prison, they're not in prison. So, okay, so, and whenever I hear people preaching about how to raise your kids, I would just like to go kill myself. Because all I hear is, oh, that's why I messed up. I mean, they're gone now, pal. They've robbed the bank. It's too late. So what I'm saying is that the guy got up how to secure a building, how to get an assistant pastor, how to raise your kids. Nothing that they said applied to me, okay? I wasn't, I wasn't that I was going to tune them out. And what I'm going to say tonight is not going to apply to some of you. No, you can't leave. You already took the offering? Yeah, you can leave. Yeah, you can leave. Of course, if you gave and it doesn't apply, you may as well stay and get your money's worth. But um, because I am going to talk to you. Now, uh, let me say this. I used to paint cars. And when you bring a car in to paint it, you know the first thing you do? You say, well, you start sanding it down. No, you don't. No, you don't. You know what you do? You wash it. You say, with what? You just wash it. You get all the dirt off of it, spray it underneath. You wash it. Then you wash it with a solvent that takes off all of the wax. And then if there's any damage, they have what they call last damage first. Like you, you, you hit a guardrail, you know, and it, and, it, and it starts at the front fender and ends at the quarter panel because the last damage may hold something in. You might pop this piece of damage out and another piece already comes out. And so you go through and, uh, and then, you, you know, you sand it down and you do these things. There's step, 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 step. And I used to paint cars in a dirty garage. Everybody, you know, you go into some of these places where to paint them and they're, they're antiseptic. You could lick the walls of the paint booth. And I used to paint in this, in this garage. I mean, we had tools all over the place that hadn't been moved in years. And there's like more dust than your mother-in-law has on her stuff, her antiques. And um, you say, how'd you do it? We hosed everything down. Man, I hosed everything down. I mean, we wet down everything. I'd, pay, I'd mask the car off. Then I'd wash the car while it had the masking off, and it'd, it'd, it'd get everything down. And I'd come out with some really clean paint jobs, never have any problem with, with paint not sticking because wax was on it. And so I can tell you how to do a paint job. Well, if you can tell somebody how to do a paint job, then you can tell somebody how to mess one up. Just don't wash it off. Oh, just... Just try sanding a car down without washing the, washing the wax off of, it, off of it and see what happens when you do that. Uh, paint that car, but don't sand it down. And the first time you go outside, man, you'll, it'll, the paint will just come off in sheets, okay? So if you know how something can be done or should be done, you also know, you ladies, you know, you bake, please tell me. And, um, and you can tell, oh, don't do it that way, Right? And, and I'm actually going to tell you, I'm going to tell you how to, tonight, uh, this is only for the people with kids, this is the ones that, if, you, if your children are grown and in prison, um, you're not qualified, uh, but I'm going to tell you how to destroy your children. Now, is there anybody here hoping to destroy their children? No, no. I've thought about killing mine, but never thought about destroying them. And you say, well, preacher, why would you tell us how to destroy them? Because if I told you how to rear them, you aren't going to listen to that anyway. But I'm going to tell you how to destroy them because some of you are following the instructions I'm going to give you tonight. Could I, before I begin, because somebody's going to be angry with me when I'm done. Why do you say you're a Bible believer and overrule Bible rules for raising your children with psychology? If you disagree with what I say tonight, it is because some child psychologist told you that what I'm telling you is wrong, not because the Bible told you it was wrong. And so I'm just going to give you that in Proverbs chapter 22, and you've heard this, and this is a funny thing. I, this, I crack up when I, every time I read this. 
Uh, chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let's bow our heads. Let's talk to the Lord. Father, it is good to be saved, and it's good to be in church. Some of these folks might be thinking right now it's not so good to be in church, but God, it's good to be in church. And God, I am glad, Lord, Lord, you, you told us how to get to heaven through this book. But you also told us how to live while we're down here. And really, God, I don't believe there is a parent. Well, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think there's a parent in here that when they have a child, they aren't concerned about wanting to raise that child properly. And you gave us a book that even tells us how to do that. So what a wonderful book. And again, God, we have no problem with you or your book. Lord, it is those um, outsiders. It is the philosophies and the psychologies and, and the experts that, that say they know more than you and more than the book that have gotten more than a foothold in our churches. And I pray, God, that you will speak to the hearts of each individual. And God, there might be some parents get angry tonight. I don't care about that. What I'm asking you tonight is save their children. I don't just mean their souls, but save them from some of the stupid things that their parents are doing. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. Now, here's why I always chuckle when I read the verse. You know that verse. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. How many times have you heard somebody quote that and go, I don't understand it. Our kids are in the world. The Bible says train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, not depart from it. And why are our kids in the world? And then somebody will come back and say, well, that's because when they're old. So when they're old, they'll come back. You know what I've never heard? I have never heard one person say, maybe I didn't train them right. Isn't it funny how we always think the weakness of that verse is where God let it down? We, none of you ever think you did a bad job raising the kid. It's always, well, you know, well, train up a child. I had them in church, and why aren't they in church today? Well, that book said they wouldn't depart. Who said you raised them right? We all have this supreme confidence that I do everything right. And so, guys... I'm going to talk to you about, about how to destroy your children. Uh, the best way, the first way. Let me ask you this before I read the verse. How many of you have children? They are not saved yet. You know, babies, whatever the case may be, uh, and you're, or you're not sure of them, but you sure want them to get saved. Let me see your hands. Anybody like that? Oh, come on, you can put them up. I'm not taking an offering. All right, a seven-year-old girl raised her hand. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so you say, well, I want them to get saved early, so we have them in church, we have them in Sunday school, and we give them the gospel, and, and we read the Bible to them. You know, there's nothing that you just said, or nothing that I just said guarantees their salvation. What if I told you you could guarantee their salvation? Would you do it? What if, you say, oh, you can't guarantee the kid's salvation. I don't know, the Bible tries to. Look what it says in chapter 23 and verse 14. It is the only verse that makes any inference to their eternity. And it says this. Oh, look at verse 13. Withhold not correction from the child. Uh, if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. You might need to know that. And then in 14, it says this. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. If you want to destroy your kid, don't spank them. Just don't spank them. Now, let me give you some advice about spanking. Um, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I say, oh, don't, don't hit him with your hand because this is something that you love with. Oh, come on, that's philosophy. I think you ought to spank him with a rod because the Bible says a rod. Um, <coughs> I, I, I just marvel when I see these people, they're going to spank their kid and they bring out a two by four. And they got holes drilled on it and flames painted on it. And oh, please, let's paint a scripture on it. And then you, you say, come out of them, you demon. <laughs> you know what I recommend? Now, 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 look what you, here's what you got. You say, oh, you can't spank your children. You can all spank your children. You'd be stupid to do it in a public restaurant now. But you can all spank your children. Okay, I, we were with a young couple one time, and um, kids was acting up. And this mother looks over, she says, do you want a timeout? 
Unaccumulated. I thought, well, that's a strange reaction. And she looked over and she says, we call a spanking a timeout. <laughs> she said, we had three boys. They thought timeout was how long they were unconscious. <laughs> Whoa, timeout was seven and a half minutes. That's a new record. <laughs> but here's what I tell people. What we used on our boys, we never had a paddle. I never used a belt. Um, we did have a baseball bat. No, three-eighths dowel rod. You get them, they're three feet long, cut it in half, 18 inches. Now, here's what you've got to do when you spank your children. You've got to assume you're going to end up in court. You, do you, re- you understand? You say, oh, no, I'm going to, look, I could call human services tonight on any family in here and say you're abusing your child, and I don't even know a thing about it, and they will investigate you. And you know what you don't want a judge to say? Where's the weapon? And they bring in this breadboard. They bring in this two-by-four with the scripture and the flames. You don't want that. And I say, here's what you do. You take the dowel rod, you cut it in half. Then you take the ends of it with sandpaper and take the edges and all of the splinters off. You say, why? Because you're going to end up in court. And you know what you're going to tell that judge? Your honor, to spank our child, the Bible says a rod. This is as close as a rod that I could get. So when I cut this in half, I was afraid some of the splinters would hurt the child. So I sanded the edges off. Then put your hand, if you're right-handed, over their kidneys and spank them. You say, why do you do that? Well, actually, I think you could probably hit above their kidneys with a rod and not really do any damage. But you see, they're worried you're not thinking about your child's safety. Well, if I'm sanding the engines off, I am thinking about my child's safety. And if I put my hand over my kidneys, if if I do ride up a little bit, I find out. (laughs) Right? Now, I said that in a church some years ago, probably about 20 years ago. And there there was a family there, unfortunately... They were, you know, uh, I think he had been married before he got saved, got divorced. Uh, He was remarried. Uh, Probably, they're still saved. I'm sorry if you have a conviction, but they're probably going to make it to heaven anyway. Uh, And he had his children from his first marriage. And like three months, the the, the first wife is unsaved, the ex-wife. And three months after I was there, this second wife writes me and says, thank you for telling us about the dowel rod. She said, because my husband's ex-wife reported us to human services that we beat the children. Get this. They used a paddle. They used the paddle with the drill holes and the whole nine yards, you know. And she said, when you said that, we got rid of the paddle, got the dowel rod, sanded the edges, blah, blah, blah. And they went into court, and here's what the judge said. Where's the weapon? Those are his exact words. And they, they, they gave him this dowel rod, and they said, he held this dowel rod like this. And he went, this is the weapon, and threw the case out. You say, oh, that's really smart. Well, that's biblical. You know why? Because a dowel rod is too light to do any internal damage. You can't, I mean, you think about it. You get this paddle, you got this, this board, You can get all kinds of power behind that. All you're going to do is sting them, okay? With that dowel, you're going to sting them. But if you don't spank your child, oh, oh, I I know why you don't spank your child. Well, we have a strong-willed child. No, your child has a weak-willed parent. Do do you know what, do you know what, uh, uh, you know what it is? You you spank a child. You know what you make them want to do? Never do it again. Whatever they did, just make them never want to do it again. Don't kill them. Just don't let them know you're not going to kill them. Make them suspect highly that you're going to kill them. And, and I've had parents go like this. Okay, come on now. We're going to have to spank you. I don't want to have to. But, I, but the Bible says I should spank you. And you stop. You know why you stop? Because the kids start screaming. And then you stop. You go, well, I spank and be so will. And he starts screaming. That's because he's spanking you. Amen. That's exactly what he's doing. 
when you spank a child, the, the, the punishment has to be worse than the offense. What if bank robbery was uh, punishable by uh, one day in jail? Right? What if murder was like a half an hour, no TV? No, oh, wait a minute. No cell phone. Anyway, you see what I'm saying? The punishment has to be worse than the offense. So you don't understand that to the kid, spank them, them is an offense to them. So they punish you worse than you're punishing them. Don't spank them. They're not, they're not strong-willed. They're rotten. They're just rotten. Come on, they're liars. Hey, there's not a person here that ever had a... Did anybody here have a uh, class on how to lie? I mean, were you going to run for public office or something? But every one of you lied before you could talk. Man, you were clean. You were fed. You were happy. Your parents took you over to the crib. They laid you down, and you sounded off like they laid you on a cactus. Ah! Ah! Oh, 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 something's wrong with the baby. Ah, 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 ah. You know, you kind of check. Everything's okay. You know, you know what some kids do in the morning? You may not know this. You've seen it in your children. You just didn't know what they're... Kids are trying to communicate, can't even talk. When they get up in the morning, we call it a tune-up where they're just frantic. It is like, ah, 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 and they're into everything. You know what they're saying? Ah, spank me, please, spank me. Because you spank them, and they, and they just calm down and go, oh, thanks. I needed that. You say, oh, you're making a joke. Oh, I'm not. Man, I mean, our kids would get up, and, and they would start running around, and they were just like, ah, ah, and I go, Oh, I know what they need. I'm a loving father. And I spank him. And he would just go like, oh, man, I'm glad I got that over with. I've had people say this. Well, you know, if you spank them, you'll frustrate them. Well, that may be true. But here's how I look at this. If I spank them, I'm going to frustrate them. If I don't spank them, I'm going to frustrate me. And at their age, they can deal with frustration way better than me. Isn't that true? I mean, if all the kid has gotten his life is a little frustration, he'll live through it. You need to spank your children. That is the only place where it says you beat them with a rod, you'll deliver their soul from hell. And you know why you're upset with what I, me, what I, me reading that? Because of what some expert told you. Could you remember what an X and a spurt is? An X is a has-been and a spurt is a drip under pressure. <laughs> and so some guy gets up and philosophizes on how to raise kids. Could I, could, could I just give you a thought? Because you probably haven't had one since you put down the remote. <laughs> Wasn't it Dr. Spock who said that spanking makes kids bad, so if we don't spank them, they'll be better? Where are his children? They're rioting in the streets. That's who Antifa is. They're burning the country down. We have, a, we have several generations who have been its unrestricted flesh. And they will kill you. You know why? Because somebody didn't beat them with a rock. Well, I just don't like that word beat. Well, change you. Because the book doesn't need changed. Well, I might put a bruise on. The Bible says the blueness of a wound cleanses the way father. Oh, brother. You know, I'm not saying you ought, to, you, ought to, you ought to bruise them, but sometimes it happens. I don't, I don't say you should try to bruise your children, but I mean, come on. Have you ever had a bruise? You ever had a broken leg? Want to make a choice? I'd take a bruise. I'll take a bruise to, you know, a, a root canal. So... It says there, look, withhold not correction from the child. If thou beatest him with a rod, he shall not die. And here's what you, some of you young parents do. You start spanking your kid, and this kid sounds off like, like somebody's killing him. You know why? Because he's punishing you. You say, what do I do? Tell him, I'm going to spank you till you stop crying. You'd be shocked how they can get control over their emotions. They will stop it right now, all right? And, and children need to be spanked. And I'm telling you, we have now got a generation, we've probably got about three generations, maybe four, 
that have grown up without being spanked. And here's the thing. I know the world is stupid and I know the world is lost. So the world looks to experts and doctors and psychologists and, and uh, psychiatrists. But I am seeing it in our churches. Young families where the children are not spanked. Can I tell you where other another place where children are not spanked? I preach all around the world. I preach in third world countries. I preach in heathen countries. Heathen never spank their children. I go to New Guinea, those heathen people, those unsaved New Guinea people, those heathen, they never spank their children. You go to a heathen nation, they never spank the kids. They don't care about the kids. They turn the kid loose in the day, and if he makes it home that night, so what? Who cares? So I got news for you, bucko. You go, well, I think we ought to be more civilized than spanking. Spanking is what brings civilization in. Not spanking is heathen. Not spanking is, is, is anti, will, will destroy civilization. It's uncivilized. So if you want to destroy your kid, don't spank them. Uh, if you want to destroy your kid, excuse their misbehavior. Well, you know, he's not feeling very good right now. You know what my kids found out? Spanking hurts just as bad when they're not feeling good. Now, look, let me ask you a question. Have you ever just not felt good? Okay. You're not feeling good. I mean, you just got one of the, you just don't feel good. Do you want that day? I don't feel good today. I think I'll go slam my thumb with a hammer. Do you want to add to your discomfort when you're not feeling good? And don't mess around, kid. Well, he's just not feeling good. Spank him. Oh, well, he, he's tired. Oh, we can keep him up just a few more seconds. I can get his attention. Well, you know, you know what you're telling him when you say, they can act up when they don't feel good. They can act up when they're tired. Here's what's going to happen. Your kid's going to shoot somebody someday and go, well, I was just tired. I, I, you know, I just wasn't feeling very good. Isn't, isn't that one stupid kid? My parents, I didn't know. I didn't know that I wasn't allowed to kill anybody. Are you out of your mind? Guys, you know, I used to explain it to my boys like this. You don't want to lose all your baby teeth on the same day. say, how'd it work? They're all out of the house. None of them have teeth. <laughs> we even got them their first apartment. I think they were all eight. <laughs> but you excuse your children because they're tired, because they're sick. You know what they need to do? They need to learn to control their flesh. Some of you young people, some of you young parents, you were not spanked. And you're having a fit with your flesh. And so you know what you're doing? You're griping about the preacher not making the church more worldly to appeal to your uncontrolled flesh. Somebody needed to smack you upside the head. You say, that's not in the Bible. I know, every now and then it sure helps. There's some folks, either they've been hitting the head not enough or too much. But some of you, you were never restricted. You were never spanked. You know, well, my parents love me. Hey, that book says if you don't spank your child, you don't love them. Oh, don't you tell me. I'm telling you. Because I'm leaving right after service. <laughs> but I am telling you that. And I don't care what you say. Because that book says if you don't spank them, you don't love them. And that book is never wrong. That is as much gospel, that is as much scripture as for whosoever shall call upon him, Lord, shall be saved. Is it not? And you're the one that thumps your chest about being a Bible believer. And then when it comes to your children, you turn them loose like a pack of dogs and ignore the very book you say you believe. Amen. Don't excuse their misbehavior. A number of years ago, I was maybe, maybe it was even 30 years ago, I was in evangelism. You know, we've been on about 32, 33 years. I can't remember what it is now. And, and um, Kathy wasn't with me, and I was, I was in a major city. And in that church, there was a university professor. There was a university uh, in the area, and, uh, and, the, and the church had a university professor. And I went, they took me to his house on Sunday afternoon to, to um, have dinner. Now, I, I knew when I walked in, they must be rich because they had two porcelain elephants. Oh, well, you got two porcelain elephants? That's big bucks. They had a cockatoo. Say, what is that? Think of a chicken with a hat on. 
they're, they're giving me the tour of the house. I'm serious. Now, you're going you to think I didn't say this. I said this. They're giving me the tour of the house. We go, every time I go by this cockatoo, it go. <laughs> and I let the guy that owned the house get a few steps from me. And I backed up and I looked at Bert. I said, shut up, Bert. I said, you're just a chicken with a hat on. I'm a Baptist preacher. I know to do the chicken. I'll turn you into a dinner in a half an hour. I burned my <laughs> And this family had three children. They had two teenagers and a four-year-old. The four-year-old was, was adopted. And they were doing the best they could to raise Jack the Ripper too. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You invite me over to your house, if your kid's a brat, I'm not going to correct them. I will watch your children set fire to your curtains as long as I can get out of the house. <laughs> Listen, if you're stupid enough to raise a monster, I don't care if he burns your house down. But I want to be able to get out. And this kid was a monster. And he would just scream. And, and he, was, he would get in your face. So we're having dinner. And I'm at one end of the table, and the monster is right next to me here. Mom's here. Dad is down there at the other end of the air cap carrier because he wants to get away from the little monster as far as he can. <laughs> and I'm putting up with this kid. Not being nice. I'm really be you would be surprised how nice I can be. And then I wake up. But anyway, um, and then this, the, the mother says, uh, now, how many children do you have? I said, I have three boys. And when I said that, this kid, it was like the lasers came on. It's like the red came in his eyes and the blood began to drip. And he looks up and he goes, I hate those three boys. Now, I really had enough of this boy at that time. And I was so nice that I didn't do anything of what went through my mind. Because he's still alive to this day. But I'd had enough. And I said, I said, son, you don't even know them three boys. You don't know if you like them, love them, hate them, or anything else. Now, I'm going to tell you something. At that moment, his mother's arm should have been this far down his throat. Amen. She should have put him right backwards over the chair. But instead, she comes to his rescue. And she said, well, he doesn't know what that word means, so he's been using it a lot lately. Well, what's he want to do when he wants to, doesn't know what a gun means? He had just been shooting people. He doesn't know what it means. And she, she, says, she said, he doesn't know what that word means, so he's been using it a lot lately. I said, well, ma'am, I said, I just had it. I said, when my boys talk that way, we teach them the shun words. She said, the shun words. I said, yes, ma'am. Concussion, laceration, traction, abusion, abrasion. Yeah. I, you said you didn't. Oh, yes, I did. I said, what happened? She got the monster away from me. She kept, I never saw the kid the rest of the afternoon. They locked him in his cell. But I'm telling you, you parents, you all justify your kids wrong. And the crazy thing is you won't justify anybody else's kids wrong. But you justify their misbehavior, and they're going to misbehave every time and say that very thing. Well, I was tired today, so I set the house on fire. I wasn't feeling very good, so I just ran over somebody today with my car. That's what you do. I was bullied. You ever hear that one? I was bullied, so I went and shot five kids at my school. Oh, poor baby. <coughs> if you want to destroy your kid, excuse their misbehavior. If you want to destroy your children, convince them that they have a value they do not have. You're a little champion. Of what? The, the biggest wet spot on the sheet in the morning? Is there a competition for that? Is that going to be the next Olympic sport? I mean, really, what does a kid, you know, well, you, you're a champion. Really? Well, that was the quarterback for Alabama just two days ago. Isn't that a champion? Isn't a champion a winner? What's he want? Well, we just think he's a champion. Well, that's because you're stupid. <laughs> so you afflict your child with your stupidity. Yeah. Yeah. He's not a champion. You say, well, what should I tell him? Tell him to go out and be something. Yeah. Tell him to go out and paint a garage. 
mow somebody's grass. You say, will that make him a champion? No, but at least make him useful. But maybe he'll, he'll, he'll do something. He'll save somebody's life. Then he can be a hero. But I got news for you. You will decide what your value is going to be. You know, you're not great because your parents think you're great. Get this T-shirt on. It's all about me. It's not about you. I saw this little girl wearing a T-shirt one time and said, let's focus on me. I thought, let's not. <laughs> and we've got an entire two or three generations and, they, and, and they've all got the t-shirt on under their clothes that says it's all about me and I'm the most important and let's focus on me. And they all think it's about them because they all think they have a value. They don't have a value. I mean, the only value, I don't mean it's bad, guys. Grind them up for dog food. That's the only value they have. I'm not saying we should do that. I've seen a few that we should. But the fact is, guys, they don't, you convince them they're a champion, they're not a champion. What are they a champion at? This participation trophy. Yeah, why didn't Georgia get one of those? <laughs> I just saw this. I can just, could you imagine, could you imagine that, that, that couple of days ago when Alabama won and all the Georgia guys going, they didn't give us a participation trophy. We at least showed up. <laughs> Everybody goes, oh, shut up. Get on the bus, you bunch of babies. Your kid participated and lost. They're not a champion, they're a loser. <laughs> tell them that one once. Oh, I couldn't tell them that. That would hurt them. Yeah, we don't want to give them reality. Yeah, right. Guys, I played little league ball when I was a kid. I played, you were looking at a guy that played second base without a glove. So that's a pretty tough job. Easy. My coach just took me out to where second base belonged, and he said, lay down here. <laughs> I played second base. I've hated spikes ever since. My little league career, I hit the ball once. It rolled to the pitcher. That was the day I knew I was called to preach. I wasn't even saved, and I knew I was called to do something other than be a pro ball player. But what I'm telling you guys is you go, well, our, our child is a champion. Your child's not a champion. No, nobody's children are champions. Well, they're worth something. No, they're not. Well, I have to tell them they're worth something. You know, I, I was listening to a child psychologist one time in a TV interview. And he was talking about Generation Y. Now, I thought Generation X was bad. But kind of like Generation Y is Generation X with their brains beat out. And here's what he said. They are the most inept generation we've ever had. They can't do anything. If the computer's down, they're really helpless. But he said, now this is what a child psychologist said. They have the highest self-esteem of any generation we've ever had. So they're good at nothing and proud of it. <laughs> here's what he said. This is a child psychologist. You want a child psychologist? He said, and they all think, that someday there's going to be a TV, a, 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 a um, reality TV program about their life. And I thought, oh, already was. Yeah, when I was a kid, came on 11 o'clock at night. Ooh. I mean, they sang the national anthem, and the little test pattern came on, and for two hours, it went, ooh. You said, well, that's boring. That's their life. Somebody said, uh, a seven-year-old wrote a book. You say, well, that's stupid. No, what was stupid was people bought it. What is a seven-year-old going to tell you? How, how to work the sandbox? I mean, there was a seven-year-old wrote a book and a bunch of people went out and bought it. That's the only thing dumber than the seven-year-old. Well, there's a nine-year-old had his own website. Yeah, that's a tough one. Guys, don't, don't tell them they have a value when they don't have a value. You know what you tell them? Go work. You know what you need to tell your children? You are not the most important person in the room. Hold a door open for somebody. You know, every now and then, I, I, I'll be at a church, a little kid will open the door, hold a door for somebody. I'll say, kid, come here. 
I said, I got some good news for you. I said, you just held that door open, right? I said, yeah. He said, yeah. I said, nobody can ever tell you you're good for nothing. I said, you can always hold the door open. You say, oh, that's stupid. No, it's not. I mean, teach them that other people are more important than them. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hands, but I am telling you, I am talking to most of the older people in this room, you were taught that, the, that everybody else was more important than you. Now we've got generations that have been told they're more important than everybody else. And you know what they want you to do? They want you other people to die. I heard a guy say this one time. It was, it was great wisdom, scary wisdom, but it was great wisdom. He said, we will. There's no doubt about it. We will have euthanasia in this country someday. I said, Psh, then there'll be youth in America. Send them back to Asia. But, um, <laughs> but he said, we will have euthanasia in this country because there's a generation that's going to grow up, and it's all about them. And they're going to look, they're going to, they're going to start. Do you understand that the Antifa generation will someday be in, be in Congress? And he said, they will look at Social Security, and they'll say, there's enough for us, and there's enough for them old people, but there's not enough for both of us, and they're going to be the voting. And they're going to vote you and me dead. Because they want the money. Because they deserve it. They don't deserve it. Guys, don't tell your children they have a value. Oh, that's the best picture. Look, I mean, look, you, could, you can make a big deal out of your kid's picture, okay? But don't tell everybody else they should. It looks like he drooled on it. Don't, unless you want to destroy your children, make everything easy on them. We had a generation, everybody, nope, they don't want anything to be tough on them. You know, I am not big on this. I don't have gone to this, but I did read it a little thing one time. You ever watch a chick? <laughs> well, I better stop there. Anyway, no, a baby chick. <laughs> hey, baby. Uh, did you ever watch a chicken coming out of an egg? That kind of chick. And you ever watch it, you know, it, you know, you see it inside there and, and it pokes a little crack in the shell and it keeps, and, and you ever, I mean, they really fight. And, and they don't just crack it open and get out. Man, like they, they cut a little hole and then they're in there, they put their little beak and they go, <sighs> And, and then they, you know, they beat a little other one, they hang their head out of the gun. <laughs> Would somebody give me a hand here? Oh, no. And you're thinking, why don't I just break that open? And they say that if you don't let that chick fight its way out of the shell, it does not have the strength to live. If you break the shell for it, it will not survive. It has got to have that struggle. Boy, some of you came up as bad families. Some of you came up some hard times. Some of you came up poor. Some of you came up on bad side of town. Some of you came up with parents that they didn't worry at all about using a belt or a, or a piece of wood or anything else. And some of you, nobody cared about you. And you know what you did? It was tough. And you got through it. And it toughened you. We are raising a generation that is, is going to be walked on by these third world nation kids when they come in here. They will kill them. They will kill them. They're all running around. Look at their, their device. They don't want to work a job. They're going to, they're going to produce a, a video or they're going to make up a, uh, a computer game and they're going to be a multimillionaire. And somebody says, why don't, you go, why don't you go shovel the sidewalks in the neighborhood? Are you crazy? <laughs> don't you know what I'm going to do someday? I know what you're going to do someday better than you do. Guys, they have to get a value. Don't tell them they got a value that they, that, they, that they don't have. Don't make life easy on them. I didn't say make life hard on them. I don't, I don't like parents that, that make life tough on their children. My parents, you know, I was an unwanted child. You guys are understanding that why more and more. But, but my parents were good people. My, my dad was a good man. My mom was a good woman. Um, clean, hardworking, and, and they didn't try. They never were abusive. They were never vicious. They didn't call, man, I hear what, you know, here's what I hear people say. Don't spank your child, just withhold love. Oh, that's a smart thing. Love's that easy to lose? 
or that easy to get. I just do something to please you and you'll love me. Well, that'll carry him for a lifetime, won't it? And so you make it easy for him. You know what they'll wonder why? Why isn't all of life? You know what this whole crowd, this whole generation can't understand why life is not easy. It's not allowed to be hard. One of the things that did surprise me, but then I figured it out about Generation Y, they're bitter. They're all bitter. Now, I could be wrong, and, and I don't have Bible for this, so you can disagree with me, that's okay. But this is just from observation, years and years of observation. You know what? I find only two things that cause bitterness. When you get bad, you don't think you deserved, or you don't get good that you think you deserved. Example, you work hard at your job, you, you put it all out there for your employer, you're the next in line, obvious for the promotion, and then they promote the boss's nephew, who's inept. And you know you, you were the guy. And from that day on, you start stealing things at work. You start taking pencils. You start taking other stuff. Well, they don't give, they didn't give me what I had coming. You're right. And you got bitter. You didn't get the good that you thought you had coming. Or something bad happened and you didn't think you deserved it. Now superimpose that format over this generation. And you know what they all think? They all think they've got, they haven't gotten good that they deserve. That's why they're bitter. See, you tell them they're a champion and they've seen champions. And when a champion walks in a room, everybody goes, hey, champ! Right? And everybody opens the doors for champions. And champions get jobs. And everybody loves the champion. They've been told all their life they're champions. And then you, they walk in a room and people act like they're a nothing. It's because they're a nothing. And now they're bitter. Because they didn't get good that, th that somebody told them they deserved. Guys, they don't deserve it. You want to destroy your child? Never say no. You got to say no. You have got to say no. We had one of our sons learned two things on the same day. That's a pretty big jump. He learned to crawl and he learned the word no on the same day. I think he was about 15 years old. <laughs> and here's what happened. As soon as he found out he could, could crawl, he wanted to be a private investigator. And so he's crawling over here and he's tugging on this, and he's pulling on this, and he's, he's pulling this over, and he's messing with my ashtrays. And, um, <laughs> and he goes to grab something he shouldn't grab, and I went, no. And he went, he said he was being defiant. Oh, he didn't know what no meant. But he learned right there. You know, for the longest time, my boys thought no had something to do with lightning. Because every time they heard no, it struck right after that. And so I said, no, and he grabbed me away, and I beat him with a rod. Later that afternoon, he crawled over. He went to grab a hold of something. I said, no. He went, not that interested. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, I am telling you guys, our nation is being burned down by a generation who's never been told no. They're a bunch of spoiled brats. Here's the problem. A two-year-old that is spoiled throws themselves on the floor and kicks and screams. A 22-year-old sets fire to downtown. Yeah. I had somebody one time say, uh, can you help me with my child? I said, I don't know, what's the problem? Well, when he gets mad, he holds his breath. I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Well, he holds his breath. I said, so, so what happens? Did he die? No. What happened? He breathes. In fact, if you want, I can show you how to get him to inhale real fast. Okay? As you, I, there ain't the kid on the ground. Listen, there ain't a three-year-old in this country I'm afraid of unless he just ran into Preakness. And I can make any three-year-old gasp. I can make him breathe. But if they don't want to breathe, well, you know, they throw themselves on their back and, and then they, they throw a tantrum. That's your fault. 
You know what's really sad? I'm going to tell you one of the saddest things there is. You have seen them. You've seen these children that are monsters. You see them in the grocery store. You see them in, 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 the, in, in stores. You see them in buildings. They are absolute monsters. And nobody can stand them. And it's their parents that need beat. Because their parents are the ones. Man, you know, our boys, my, you know, our, our kids' kids, they're good. Man, our, you know Nathan's kids? When they're conscious, they're really good. But isn't it funny? You, you, some of you, I'll bet you some of you have done it. You, you discipline your children. You're sitting in a restaurant. They're all orderly. They're all nice. They say thank you. The waitress comes over and says, wow, how did you raise these children? She said, we spanked them. And, oh. That's exactly. Isn't it funny? They want the product. They don't want the, the process. Because you ain't going to get that out of, you're a champion, you're important. If they're important, they're going to say what they want to say, and they're going to get mad at you for trying to stop them. You need to tell your children no. Guys, can I ask you a question? Isn't life full of no? I've had, I've had adults say this. They'll go, I got told no when I was a kid. Nobody tells me no anymore. I had a guy say that one time. I said, you stop at red lights? Isn't a red light no? Brother, everybody gets told no. Let me ask you something. Anybody here ever prayed and God distinctly said no? Life is full of no. It, it happens, guys. And sometimes, and, and look, let me ask you this. Some of you, years ago, God said no. You might have been mad at God or brokenhearted or upset or sad. Now you look back and think that was the best thing you ever did. Or you saved me from me. Because I would have ruined my life right there if you'd have said yes. You were smarter than me. No kidding. Guys, you're supposed to be smarter than your kids. And then you listen to some psychologist and then you lose your mind. You want to destroy your children? Accept their sin. When they go out and live ungodly, you accept their sin. Oh, I've, I'm so sick of mothers. And they come up and go, well, you know, our son's gay. And, and we know it's wrong, but we love him. And so we're just going to, you don't love him. You know who you love? Yourself. You love yourself because that book would, you know what, you, what some mothers need to do? Smack that kid across the mouth and say, get off my porch until you drop your voice about three octaves and can say your S's properly. <laughs> and maybe that would motivate that kid to get squared away. And all of you, how many of you parents think some things are really terrible for kids to do until your kid does it? And then all of a sudden, we just need to have love. We just need to have grace. No, no, you don't love them. And you don't love Jesus Christ. You love yourself. You know what you need to do? Say, if you're going to live, I know, look, I'm, I know some of you, your kids are going to grow up. They're going to get out of church. They're not going to live for God. But you know the difference between that and living like hell itself? There are people out there living like hell itself. And if your kid chooses that path, you know what you need to say? Come back when you get squared away. Come back when you get right. Or don't come back. But the thought of that just destroys some of you parents. Well, I'll never see him again. I'm sorry. But you know what they'll do? They'll come home and they'll, they'll corrupt their younger brothers and sisters. They'll molest their cousins because you said you love them. You don't love them. You love yourself. You don't like, you don't like the price of their sin. Guys, you, you accept their sin. You excuse their sin. Well, we love them. You don't love them. You love you. You want to destroy your child? Don't spank them. Excuse their misbehavior. Convince them they have a value they do not have. Make everything easy on them. Don't say, never say no to them and accept their sin. I will guarantee you, you do that, you'll destroy your kid. And everything I just told you is what the world will tell you to do with your child. I, I don't understand it. What I don't understand is that in our churches, mothers are raising their children 
according to how some psychologists overruled their Bible. There are mothers who say they believe the King James Bible, and when that book says, beat your kid with a rod, he'll just deliver his soul from hell, they look at that, that verse with contempt. And then they jump on the old man if he spanks the kid. This world, our country is now run by overbearing women and effeminate men. Amen. Now, lady, lady, if I just made you mad, don't come down and tell me after this because I'll know. <laughs> and don't send that worm of a husband down to tell me because <laughs> I'll know. All of this stuff, you know, you know what? Women get offended. No, no offense, ladies. Anyway, but you know, men used to never get offended. I mean, two guys, they, they'd argue about something. Hey, I can't get over it when a man walks up and says, you said something that offended me. <laughs> change your nylons. <laughs> I mean, come on. They offended me. Men never, that never used to bother a man. Now men are acting like women. He said, well, you don't think there's a difference? You don't think there's a difference? Don't come around me. Amen. Hey, I'm going to help you with something. You know this transgender bathroom thing? Men, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you men some advice. If you're ever in a men's restroom and a woman walks in, knock her out. <laughs> knock her right out. And when she comes to, she's going to say, but I was identifying as a man. And you just say, yeah, but that day I was identifying as a woman, and I don't want a man in my restroom. Let's read a verse. It's found in a very rare place in the Bible, the book of Proverbs. You're going to have a long way to go. It's chapter 22. It's in verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, do not depart from it. You know what some of you, I'm sorry, parents. I'm sorry, some of you kids out there in the world. Just maybe. You didn't raise them up right. Maybe you didn't train them right. We always think God didn't take care of his half of the verse. We, we never have any doubt that we have taken care of our half. And yet, come on, guys. Who is always right? God. And if you and God disagree, who is always wrong? You. And so maybe if your kids are not living for God. I'm very sorry for this. Maybe you didn't raise them right. But you who still got them sitting on your lap here, there's time. There's time. But if you want to destroy them, get this message and listen to it every day. You don't have to get this message. Tune in to any child psychologist, and they'll tell you the same thing I'm telling you without the Scripture. But if you want to save them, put them over your knee and spank them. I'm telling you, they will thank you. They will thank you. They will, they will be... They will be good. That book, sa that book says when you spank them, they'll give you some peace. So you need some peace. They're, that's what I say. They, some mornings they get up. They just need a tune-up. Just spank them. Just give them a couple swats. Go, oh, 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 man, I needed that. And then everybody's day is better. They're happier. You're happier. The child psychologist is biting his fingernails, but who cares about him? But guys, I'm telling you, if we don't start spanking our kids again, Oh, but I'm worried about the state. I think you're using the state for an excuse to be untrue to your book. And so go ahead and be untrue to the book. I don't even care if you're not true to this book. But I'm telling you, you're going to destroy your children. You are going to destroy them. Absolutely destroy them. Because there's a generation out of our churches that think they can do nothing wrong and that nobody should tell them no. And they didn't get any of that from the Bible. They got it from outside the Bible. I have one question for you. Don't answer it to me. If you disagree with me, don't come up and tell me about it. I don't care. But why would you overrule Scripture with what the world told you? Why would somebody's theory, Spock was a theory. Has that theory not been proven faulty? 
Why would you overrule scripture with a theory? I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. Your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Now, I told you, many you, you know who you are tonight, who you are exempt. Your children are already grown, they're out of here. You're not going to grab your 30-year-old and turn them over your knee. This message did not apply to you. But would you shut up when your kids spank their kids? Why, why is it that grandparents wail on their, parent, their kids, and then when their kids spank their kids, it's all like, well, you shouldn't do that. Just get out of the room. Your grandkids need it as bad as you do. Let your kids do what they have to do. Let me tell you something. If you don't like what I said, if you ever see somebody spank your kid, their kid, if you ever turn them in, I hope God burns your house down. I have had people, I've heard of people in churches turning people in in their church for spanking their kids. Somebody ought to drive over you with a car. If, you, if you're going to destroy your family, then destroy it. Don't destroy somebody else's too. But spank your children. You say, why? Book says so. You'll never come up with all this philosophy. You come up and give me your philosophy, you never got it from the book. Don't you twist the love of Jesus into your miserable philosophy. That book says, beat them with a rod, deliver their soul from hell. I didn't say beat them with a, with a club. I didn't say beat them with a, with, a, with a belt. I didn't say beat them with a board. I don't believe you ought to. I think you ought to take a rod. And I think you ought to have their, their welfare in mind. You ought to be able to tell a judge, Your Honor, my, I, I know I need, my children need spanked. I want a way to do it. I put my hand over their kidneys so that I could never injure them there. I sanded the edges of it so there'd be no splinters. And that judge can't say, You didn't care about your kids because that's what they want to do. And don't be stupid and don't spank them downtown in the mall. But they need spank. And if they, if they scream their head off when they're getting spanked, say, this will stop when you stop. You say, oh, they can't control it. They control it way more than you think. I've seen people that give their kid two little taps, and the kid sounds off like you, like you hit him with a pin, and, and they think, see, spanking didn't work. If you think spanking doesn't work, it was your application that was wrong because the Bible is not wrong. So I'm going to have a word of prayer. And if you need to come down and talk to the Lord, you come down and talk to the Lord. Some folks have been here. If you need to come and talk to God, you know what some of you ought to do? If you got spanked, you ought to go back to your parents and say, thank you so much. Thank you so much for spanking me. I stand here tonight. My dad never spanked me. My mom did. My dad never did. My mom didn't do it enough. But I'm telling you, you need to spank your children. You say, how do you know? Book says so. Care about their soul? Spank your children. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for this book that it covers way more than salvation. It just covers everything about life. And I am sorry, God. I apologize. I'm in the best churches on the planet. King James, Bible-believing, independent Baptist churches. And on behalf of those churches, I apologize. For those who would be vehement and fight for the perfection of this King James Bible, they'd defend it and yet turn right around and condemn it when it tells them to spank their children. That's an inconsistency, Father. Help these people. Help these young parents. Help these who are not parents yet. Help them to be true to this book. Help them to really love their children enough to spank them. God, I pray that we, we cannot save this nation, but I pray we save our own children. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. With your heads bowed, eyes closed, as piano plays, if you want to come and talk to the Lord, why don't you come?